Okay. So I think we're ready and uh, Tanaji, you're open. So I will go on mute and uh, we'll wait for the participants to join. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's sharp three o'clock here in the afternoon in India. And um, I think we can start um, as more attendees join us. Uh, but again, good afternoon and welcome very much um, to this uh, conversation. Thank you very much for joining us for the second of the three part dialogue series, DRI dialogue series on implementing nature based solutions for resilient infrastructure. Um, drawing on the first conversation that looked at the conceptualization of NBS in infrastructure and presentation of examples and processes of delivering on NBS linked infrastructure solutions, practices and models. This conversation with our excellent panel of experts and practitioners will delve into how we know that NBS works in delivering sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our speakers um, and invite our moderator for the day, Dr. Karen Sudmaya Ryu to shepherd us through this crucial discussion on demonstrating the value proposition of NBS in infrastructure. Um, Dr. Ryu, Asudmaya Ryu is a senior scientist at TH Cologne in Germany. Prior to this, uh, Karen was the senior advisor for disaster risk reduction with the United Nations Environment Programs, Disaster and Conflicts Program in Geneva, uh, where she managed several large projects uh, related to ecosystem uh, based DRR, eco DRR in short. Um, she has over two decades of experience uh, researching, teaching, and publishing in EcoDRR, including the development of two MOOCs, uh, massive online op uh, open online courses. Um, she holds a PhD in environmental science from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland and a master's degree in uh, international development and forest ecology from uh, Switzerland and the United States. I also take the liberty to share that Karen, while still at UNEP, in, her, in a different hat, um, was instrumental in giving shape to this DRI dialogue series, and we truly appreciate her thought leadership. And it's great that we have her to uh, moderate today. Um, I just want to say that in a world with increasing frequency and intensity and impact of disaster events and much to do for adaptation, particularly for the most vulnerable, NBS may just be the magic pill that bridges development, sustainability, resilience, biodiversity, and social well being. So without much further ado, I hand, now hand over to the hand over the dialogue to her expert moderation and facilitation. Thank you, Karen, and over to you and welcome to all of you again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tanaji, for uh, the invitation to moderate the session and uh, welcome to participants from around the world. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to be here and introduce some of a fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, so first of all, a little bit of uh, business before we get started is that um, our uh, thanks to the donor, the uh, European Commission for co-funding um, this uh, event. And um, but, you know, when we have donors, we also have to do a little bit of homework sometimes to show uh, impact. So one of the uh, homeworks we have to do is actually um, uh, ask participants to kindly fill out a pre-test knowledge assessment, which should be uh, kind of fun, hopefully, and um, colleagues will be putting in the link in the chat. Um, please go ahead and do that. So uh, you should now see a link in the chat. Uh, I'd like to confirm that uh, I don't see it there yet. If uh, Neha can confirm that you have put the link um, to SurveyMonkey in the chat. And yes, I've shared it already. It's there. Okay. So if you can please go ahead, participants, and fill that out. Um, take a few minutes. There should only be a few questions. And uh, 
hopefully you'll find the questions a bit tricky because they're supposed to be a little bit tricky because guess what? After the session, you will have a post knowledge assessment to see if your knowledge has increased well. So uh, please go ahead and uh, fill out that survey. There are, I think, just uh, eight questions and um, it should, uh, Sobi says, no link is posted in the chat. Uh, so let's see here if you can, the chat is disabled and there's no survey there. Well, let's see, so we have a bit of a technical issue there. Um, let's see if CDRI can get that figured out. So um, in the meantime, <laughs> once you've got the chat uh, issue, somebody says it's now there. Looks like it's working. And if you can please post the survey link one more time so that our participants can fill that out properly. So the questions are related to some of the, uh, I would say some of the elements that are in the slides. So if you don't have, if you don't know the answers, that's only normal. And hopefully once you have seen the presentations, then you will be able to uh, answer the questions. So please go ahead. And I see the chat is there. I mean, the pretest link is there in SurveyMonkey. So what I will do while um, we're asking you to fill out, do your homework, um, according to what our, uh, the donor has requested, please go ahead and do that. What I will do then is I will have the honor to present um, the participants. So hopefully uh, you're able to multitask and hear me present the participants while you fill out the pre-test questions. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Joseph Price, who is a policy specialist at the United Nations Environment Program, where he is part of a team coordinating the implementation of the UN Environmental Assembly Resolution on Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure. His responsibilities include leading consultations and case studies in Central Asia and Chile, and his background um, in research and policy advice in Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, Bolivia, and the UK, with a focus on the politics of natural resources. And Joseph holds um, Masters of Philosophy in International Relations and Politics from the University of Cambridge and a Bachelor's from King's College of London. And he's a fellow of the Royal Geograph Geographical Society and he's based in Geneva. So for participants who are just joining, please keep uh, see the pretest um, in the chat. Please click on the link and fill out just a few questions that are there that would really help uh, the team um, in showing that there hopefully has been an increase of knowledge from this webinar. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Mr. Eduardo Carlucci who is a policy analyst in sustainable finance supporting IISD, uh, the International Institute of Sustainable Development's infrastructure work stream. And he works on the financial assessment of nature-based infrastructures and on a variety of research topics on sustainable finance. And prior to joining ISD, Eduardo worked for the European Federation of Investors and Financial Services Users in the context of the European Union Sustainable Finance, focusing on the EU green bond standards, the eco label for financial products, and analysis of ESG financial products. And Eduardo holds a master's degree in European studies with a specialization in economics from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Again, uh, colleagues, please take the pretest here. You'd really help out the team. Um, as this is one of our donor requirements. You can see the link is there. The next speaker after Eduardo will be uh, Professor Laszlo Pinter, who is a professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy at the Central European University in Austria and senior fellow at the International Institute of Sustainable Development in Canada. He is interested in systems-based understanding of unsustainable or sustainable challenges in a wide range of geographic and thematic contexts. He spent 16 years at IASD working on the measurement and integrated assessment of progress, national sustainable development strategies, 
and strategic foresights at global, national, and community levels, serving as Director of Measurement and Assessment. Um, and he joined CEU, so the Central European University in Austria in 2010, where he teaches courses on sustainable development, adaptation, and resilience in social ecological systems. And his most recent work extends to nature-based infrastructure and solutions as a catalyst in advancing urban resilience. And he has a PhD from the University of Minnesota. That's also where I went to school, so maybe we know each other from there. A master's in natural resources from uh, Canada, a master's from the Hungarian University of Agriculture. And finally, and last but not least, we are very fortunate um, and excited to have Professor Konji Anju, who um, is um, at Peking University. He received a doctorate at the Harvard School of Design, and he founded the Graduate School of Landscape Architecture and the College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at Peking University. He's especially known for his sponge cities and other revolutionary nature-based solutions for climate adaptation. His approach to urban planning and design has been implemented in over 200 cities in China and beyond, and has significantly impacted national policies for improving the environment in China. So you see the exciting lineup of speakers that we have. And what we'll do now is uh, you can continue taking the pretest, but we will hand over now to our first speaker, Mr. Joseph Price. Um, and uh, we will have his slides come up on the screen. And uh, Joseph, you have 15 minutes. We'll wait for the slides to come up on full screen. And so over to you, Joseph, thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. And thanks for the introduction, Karen. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about the International Good Practice Principles for Sustainable Infrastructure. I'll start off by providing um, a bit of background to these principles and how they were developed, what they aim to achieve um, before outlining the 10 principles themselves. And then I'll zoom in on the principle number four, which I think is of most relevance um, and interest for this webinar. So the work really began um, back in 2018 with a UN Environment Assembly resolution on sustainable infrastructure, um, which provided a mandate for the development of the principles, which was uh, delivered on through the UNEP-led Sustainable Infrastructure Partnership, the SIP, um, which is essentially a, a network of organizations working to support and promote integrated approaches to sustainable infrastructure. And so through the SIP, around 30 organizations developed um, the initial draft of these principles, which were then consulted on with over 70 UN member states. So this was, um, of course, to ensure that the principles reflected all the, the good practices, priorities and realities of, of countries on the ground around the world. Um, and so through this process, a first edition was published um, earlier last year and then subsequently there was a further consultation across the UN system uh, through the UN Environment Management Group which coordinates environmental issues across all UN entities. So essentially through this process different UN entities provided feedback and inputs on the principles uh, and ultimately endorsed them as a second edition earlier this year for the fifth session of the UN Environment Assembly which also then delivered a subsequent renew resolution on sustainable and resilient infrastructure. And so in this resolution, there's recognition of the principles specifically as it encourages member states and other stakeholders to consider implementing and in integrating the principles into national policy frameworks. And importantly as well, um, this resolution promotes investment in nature-based solutions, including natural infrastructure, which I think is important to highlight. So this is um, kind of the background and the mandate to this work and how we arrived at these 10 principles on the next slide then, please. So yeah, this is culminated in 10 guiding principles primarily aimed at policymakers and public planners, but also of relevance to other stakeholders and actors, um, including private sector actors, civil society. And the 10 principles are really focused on integrated systems level approaches. So I'll speak a little bit more about what I mean by that um, in the following slides. But essentially, rather than um, focusing on project level sustainability and project level guidance, the principles seek to um, highlight interventions that can be made at the early planning phases of the infrastructure life cycle and um, 
seek to provide guidance on helping governments create an enabling environment for sustainable infrastructure at a broader systems level beyond the individual projects for infrastructure. And so on the next slide, please. So the integrated approaches that are captured across these 10 principles are really all about um, firstly, integrating the different aspects of sustainability. So not only focusing on environmental sustainability at the core, but also integrating that with the social, economic and institutional aspects of sustainability. It's about integrating um, different infrastructure sectors and systems across time and space. So looking at some of the key synergies um, and trade-offs between sectors such as energy and water, for example, and also the important role that nature plays in infrastructure planning, including the impacts, but also incorporating nature-based solutions into, um, into hard or built infrastructure. And related to this is uh, understanding impacts and benefits at the aggregate level, again, not on a project by project basis, but understanding the cumulative effects, including at a broader landscape scale. And finally, the principles um, cover some good practices with respect to integrated governance policies and processes. So both between um, sectoral ministries and central government, but also at different levels of administration. So local government, regional, national, and also the, the broader international context and environment um, for international policy making. So what are these 10 principles then? So on the next slide, you can see the 10 principles listed here. As I said, I'm not going to go into to all of these in detail. I'm going to focus on um, principle number four, which I think is of most, um, most relevance for this webinar. But as you can see, it ranges all the way from strategic planning early on to issues around uh, transparency, participation, financing, resource efficiency and circularity. Um, but we're going to look a little bit more now about principle number four on the next slide, which is avoiding environmental impacts and investing in nature. So on the next slide, please, this, this principle states that adverse environmental impacts from infrastructure should be minimized and natural capital enhanced to the greatest degree possible. Construction should be avoided in areas important for the persistence of biodiversity or having high ecosystem service value. The development of physical infrastructure should seek to complement or strengthen rather than replace nature's ability to provide services such as water supply and purification, flood control and carbon sequestration. Nature-based solutions should be prioritized. And each of the principles has um, around three components or subheadings. The third of which, which I think is very key here is prioritizing nature-based solutions. So just to delve into that in a little bit more detail, it highlights how Investing in the restoration and protection of ecosystems, such as mangroves, for example, as a nature-based solution for flood protection and resilience. Highlights how it can save millions of dollars per year in the costs um, of site construction and maintenance, while also preserving ecosystem functionalities and therefore maintaining the range of livelihoods that often rely on such ecosystems. And since preserving natural ecosystems is much less costly than restoring or replacing them, Decision makers and policymakers should prioritize their protection when planning infrastructure and look to maximize the synergies between natural and gray infrastructure. So on the next slide then please, um, going back to the idea of integrated approaches. Of course, principle number four can't just be implemented in isolation without thinking about the connections and linkages with, with other principles and different angles of sustainability and policy. Um, so if we can take here, for example, principle number eight on fiscal sustainability and innovative financing and how this relates to prioritizing nature-based solutions. Um, of course, here it's not only the government that has a, a key role um, in scaling up investments and prioritizing the right investments in sustainable infrastructure and nature-based solutions, but also other actors like the private sector and investors have an important role to play. Um, a recent UNEP report has shown that if we're to tackle the triple planetary crisis, um, then investments in nature-based solutions need to be tripled by 2030. And so this requires um, established and clear financing mechanisms and instruments that enable nature-based solutions, but also um, stable and clear regulatory and policy frameworks, um, but also tools to appraise and evaluate um, 
the effectiveness or the relevance of nature-based solutions in comparison to built or hard infrastructure solutions. Um, and this is something as well that UNIP has been working on over the last year or two to address. Um, and then related to this, another interesting linkage is the, the angle of consultation and participation. So that's what principle nine concerns, um, because nature-based solutions, at least in part, often rely on indigenous knowledge. And many indigenous communities around the world have been using these types of solutions for many centuries. Um, and so um, infrastructure and nature-based solutions when there's externally devised projects should um, look to harness indigenous knowledge and incorporate um, preferences of local communities and priorities as early on in the decision-making process and as early on in the, the infrastructure life cycle as possible, which is really key for a variety of reasons. Um, first of which to avoid conflict. This is a key cause of conflict if there's not adequate consultation early, early in the process and that local priorities and needs are, are not reflected early on but also broadly to respect and fulfill human rights and ultimately to ensure that infrastructure services um, meet the needs and requirements on the ground, which is ultimately what they're designed to do, of course. So I hope this has given a bit of a flavor of the 10 principles as an overview, and in particular on principle number four. I'm gonna end by just talking a bit about some complementary resources on the next slide that UNEP has uh, to complement these 10 principles. So the first of which is the Sustainable Infrastructure Tool Navigator that UNEP co-manages with uh, GIZ. So this is a collection of different resources, methodologies and tools um, on an online platform, which is designed to help integrate sustainability into infrastructure and ultimately help implement the principles. And in addition, alongside the publication of the principles, UNEP released a complementary case studies publication, which has 10 case studies that illustrate each of the principles in practice. Um, and we're continuing as well to develop case studies, um, both on the principles, but also to illustrate different tools in the navigator on an ongoing basis. Um, and you may be interested to hear that shortly we'll be releasing one, another case study on principle four on ecosystem based disaster risk reduction in Japan that we collaborated on with the, the Ministry of Environment in Japan. So I'll leave it there um, as an overview. I hope that's helped frame um, the rest of the session and happy to, to speak a bit more and answer any questions or share the links as well in the chat if people are interested. Uh, thank you very much again. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. And I would just like to, uh, again, remind our participants before we move on to please take the um, Please take the pretest. Um, uh, what I should have mentioned is that there are certificates uh, available to participants who take both the pretest and the post test. Um, now, many of the answers were in uh, Joseph's uh, presentation. Thank you, Joseph, for having sent in some of the questions, but uh, please go ahead and do so. And participants, I would really love to see where you're from. So please uh, use the chat function and introduce yourself since we can't, uh, we don't see you. Uh, please uh, put in the chat uh, where you're from, maybe your name, which organization you're from, and um, where you're calling in from today. It'd be really fun to see that um, in the chat. So please go ahead. We'll try to make this as interactive as possible. Now, uh, Joseph, I'm interested um, in just a quick question on um, uh, the Sustainable Infrastructure Partnership. How does that work and who's involved? Um, again, I'm reminding uh, the participants that the um, the theme of the session is how do we know it will work, right? Nature-based solutions. So how is this partnership helping to fill the knowledge gap on um, knowing that nature-based solutions for resilient infrastructure will work? Over to you, Joseph. Sure, so yes, yeah, ultimately a network of organizations um, that is carrying out activities ranging from raising awareness on the role of infrastructure for the SDGs and the Paris Agreement um, to also developing normative and technical guidance like the, the principles um, but also strengthening capacities, um, institutional technical capacities um, in countries around the world. Um, and some of the key partners range from other international organizations and UN entities, um, but also multilateral development banks, private sector, civil society. Um, so really all the key stakeholders um, internationally for sustainable infrastructure. And in terms of addressing um, some of these gaps that the, the webinar is looking to explore. Um, 
in particular, I'd say that one of the areas that we've we found has been key over the last couple of years is that ability to appraise and evaluate nature-based solutions for infrastructure um, when compared with hard infrastructure. So we've been working with the University of Oxford over the last year to develop a framework um, to quantify the benefits of, of nature-based infrastructure um, and to help policymakers um, and investors ultimately evaluate them. As I said, um, and that's something that countries as well have come to us um, and said this, this is something that they're really interested in promoting. There's a lot of um, appetite and interest at a national level and in, in different governments around the world, but sometimes there's a lack of understanding about um, sometimes even the definition, but also what it entails, how the performance can be monitored, some of the risks as well from a private sector perspective. Sometimes there's a perceived risk in investing in these types of solutions when compared with um, potentially more traditional hard and built infrastructure. Um, so yeah, this is really an overview of the, the work of the SIP and some of the priorities that we've been thinking about in the last year or two. Great, thank you, that was very useful. So uh, please go ahead, um, use the chat to tell us your name and where you're from. Also, please send us um, any questions uh, to the panelists. We'll have a Q&A session a little bit later on. So your questions, you have, still have time to think about them, but no need to be shy. We'll, we'll keep track of your questions. So with that, uh, Joseph, thank you very much. And uh, we will invite the next speaker to come, Mr. Eduardo Calucci. Again, I already gave a long introduction, but he's a policy analyst with Sustainable Finance of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So over to you, Eduardo, to share your screen and uh, go ahead with your presentation. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for the presentation, for the introduction. Uh, hope you can see the, the correctly the presentation. Yes, it looks very good. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, um, I will present today uh, how at ISD we uh, provide a customized valuation of the MBI project and I will show what type of tools we use and then I will make uh, a concrete example of an MBI project that we work on in, um, uh, on the, on, on, in Colombia. So uh, with the MBI Global Research Center, we aim to establish a business case for natural-based uh, infrastructure. And the objective, the main objective is to address the barriers uh, in scaling up the use of MBI infrastructure, decision-making, but also adaptation planning. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main barriers that we face generally are the lack of predictability and certainty of investment in MBI. MBI the lack of comparison between MBI and investment in built or care infrastructure, but also lack of identification or recognition of revenue streams. So in order to face these barriers, it's necessary to have a systemic approach to identify, quantify, and monetize the cost and the co-benefits of, uh, of an MBI uh, investment. Uh, also, uh, in, in order to achieve this, uh, uh, we uh, work with sustainable asset valuation methodology in order to make this uh, this happen to overcome these uh, these barriers. Uh, so, as you can see in this slide, we have some examples of the assessment that we did in the past. Uh, so the the what we call the uh, sustainable asset valuation savvy. Uh, is a methodology that quantifies and values the environmental, social, and economic externalities for infrastructure projects. Um, the uh, the SAVI tool uh, is based on four main characteristics. Uh, with the first of all, it's based on system and on different type of uh, systems, uh, system thinking, system dynamics. Uh, simul uh, special models and project financial modeling. It's also customized to each individual uh, infrastructure project or policy, and is also made through the uh, multi-stakeholder approach, which actually helps the identification of material risk and different type of opportunities, which are specific to the to the project. Um, it also incorporates best-in-class climate da uh, data from the EU Copernic Copernicus Climate uh, cl Climate Store. Um, 
the Savvy tool that we use then can analyze different type of uh, MBI, uh, natural-based infrastructure. And to make some, ex some examples, we have forest, which including uh, uh, agroforestry and forest preservation, uh, urban landscape like rain gardens and green roofs, also wetlands, uh, for example, preservation and restoration of wetlands and lakes, uh, and also coastal reef and mangrove forest, and also river restoration and dike re relocation, for example. Uh, the main features of SAVI are, can be grouped in three aspects. One is simulation, the other one is valuation and the, uh, customization. So uh, the, uh, the simulation basically uh, includes uh, the outputs of the system thinking, the system dynamics and the special models uh, and the project uh, finance. So the, the, the finance modeling. Uh, in order to achieve this, we use different type of tools. Uh, so for system dynamics, for example, we use Vensim. For project finance, we use the FAST standard. And for the special modeling, we use GIS and invest tool. Uh, when we uh, look at the financial performance indicator, so actually Savi also uh, simulates how the cost of material risk and externalities affect these indicators, and we take to ac into account like the present uh, net present value, internal rate of return as uh, financial indicators. Then, uh, uh, as I previously said, we look at evaluation. So value, the Savi plays a monetary value on economic, social, and environmental risk. So this can be different type of risk in this case, like for example, environmental risk or climate risk, uh, political, legal risk, or also social risk and economic risk. So these are analyzed under this section. Uh, second of all, uh, Savi also identify value and values in financial terms, the externalities that come up from a direct consequence of the infrastructure project. So uh, basically, it also can identify, quantify, and explain how the externalities of today, they can transform uh, transformed into material risk tomorrow. And uh, in this case, uh, the externalities are grouped in three, in three uh, area. So environmental, environmental externalities, social externalities, and economic externalities. To make an example, as environmental externalities, we can consider water and air pollution as a social, for example, loss of traditional jobs or generation of new job as a positive externalities, externality, and also economic externalities in the sense of contribution to economic development or new trade opportunities. Another characteristic of SAVI is that it's uh, customized. So all SAVI valuations are customized to the uh, local social, economic, and environmental context. So I now make uh, an example, a more practical, practical example. So this is, uh, uh, we worked on this assessment for the Mallorquin swamp in, in, in Colombia. Uh, to give a little bit of a context, so because of urban development and waste disposal, uh, the area has been degraded uh, in the Mallorquin swamp, and there have been damages of the mangroves in the wetland. Also, the port development has also restricted the flow of uh, fresh water uh, for, from the Magdalena River into the swamp. And this has resulted in some particular issues and loss of ecosystem services, which are, for example, the flood control, the biodiversity protection, fishery support, and carbon storage. Uh, the project itself uh, for the, to solve, overcome these issues, is a project that aims to plant mangroves in 1.8 hectares uh, of the swamp and uh, to invest in ecotourism infrastructure. So there are expected to see some uh, some some opportunities and benefits in this case, like for example stabilization of the coastline, protection of against floods, and uh, improving water quality, for example, or provide a sustainable source of income for the uh, for the residents. Uh, 
the savvy assessment goal in this case is to assess the economic and social environmental impacts of mangroves restoration and the ecotourism in the in the area also to quantify the cost and benefits and the financial performance of the infrastructure of the natural based infrastructure but also to compare the uh, performance of the natural based infrastructure with uh, uh, a similar uh, services provided by gray infrastructure so there is also uh, important to provide this kind of uh, comparison uh, the analysis starts with a causal loop diagram so this is just to show you how it look like but it's very complex uh, process because it's it involves uh, several stakeholders which are involved in the in the project and it's it's it provides a system that provides uh, 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 indicators and uh, the causal relation between them, but this is achieved with the uh, several stakeholders involved involved in the in the in the project, and is also identified the relevant relevant variables for the infrastructure. So, for example, as you can see here, the main uh, indicators are the waste and water and the wastewater generation, carbon storage. Uh, the population exposed to extreme climate, climate events and also climate related damages to the infrastructure. These are the main aspects of this project. Uh, after that, we provide an, a special analysis which involves the land cover map, carbon storage and the habitat quality, providing an analysis across years from 2017 to 2021 showing how the land has changed across the years. Uh, so for example, for both carbon storage and habitat quality, there is a decrease uh, con uh, from 2017 to 2019, but an increase for, 20, for 2021. Uh, after this, the, it's possible to identify uh, the, in the benefits, uh, the cost and benefits. So this is provided through an integrated cost benefit analysis. And the, in this case, for this particular project, we have cash flows, uh, direct cost. So that's construction cost and maintenance cost. But when it comes for externalities, we have avoided costs, for example, which are flood damages, water pollution and carbon emissions and other type of benefits, like, for example, wages from uh, job creation, tourism revenue and fishing income. Um, this is to show you how it looks like a cost integrated benefit analysis uh, from uh, 2022 to 2041. Um, you can see here that uh, the analysis is done for the two type of infrastructure, infrastructure, the gray infrastructure and the MBI. So we use a gray infrastructure as a comparison to the MBI to show a the business case. And the, uh, the true infrastructure analyzed with the benefit of tourism and without the benefit of, of tourism. And as well, the analysis is done across two type of climate scenario, the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5. Uh, the second one, it's a more extreme climate scenario compared to the first one. And the results are uh, the following. So it's possible to observe the that the largest benefit that results from the restoration project is tour tourism revenue. Um, and, the, and that without this benefit, actually the project is not econo economically attractive in the low climate change scenario. However, we can see that the natural-based uh, infrastructure with tourism, tourism is the most uh, economically attractive uh, compared also to the, to the, uh, to the to the gray infrastructure. And with more mangroves, there is less erosion, flood, water pollution, carbon emissions. So this means that the impact of restoration is much larger under a higher climate change scenario. And this shows that the restoration in actually increased climate resilience in this case. Uh, just to give uh, another information in this, all the values are in 2021 prices and the effect of inflation is not considered here. This is another uh, graph to show that the uh, cumulative values, they start to grow for the MBI from 2027, uh, when actually the tourism increase. And by 2035, the, cum the cumulative value uh, of restoration is positive. 
so this also to, to show that natural based infrastructure is more economically attractive if we consider uh, uh, in, uh, the tourism, it's all, but it's always more attractive than the gray infrastructure. Uh, after this, we have uh, the, the, the financial analysis so that we, we, we incorporate the externalities into the financial indicators. Uh, the same analysis is done across the two types of infrastructure, and we consider the net present value and the IRR, the uh, internal rate of return. So if the net present value is greater than zero, then the project creates benefits, more benefits than cost. And uh, the uh, IRR is the cumulative average of annual return on an investment. So a larger IRR means that the project creates more value per dollar invested. And this is how we present the financial indicators we, which incorporates the externalities and the risk that we observed before. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, to conclude, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we generally look for different type of projects, uh, for example, natural ecosystem and working landscape or hybrid infrastructure. Uh, the project stage can be in early design planning or implementation. And uh, also the project proponents will need to work with us to provide several data for the project. In terms of impact, we look projects that uh, make a contribution to climate change adaptation and uh, uh, also uh, projects that can have an impact on policy changes. In terms of location, we look for projects in, the love, in, the, in developing countries and the area uh, that are vulner, vulnerable for climate change. I also have a link here. If you want to submit uh, uh, your projects, I can also provide the link uh, through the chat. And uh, these are our, our main donors and partners. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Eduardo, for this uh, extremely interesting presentation. I always uh, love hearing about Savi and seeing how you improve it. Um, every year I see some new improvements coming. Um, so colleagues, again, thank you so much also for having responded in the chat. I see uh, participants coming from around the world. We have participants from Albania, from India, from Bhutan. Uh, I saw somebody from uh, Zambia, Nigeria, Thailand. It's really fantastic to see so many people coming, uh, joining here from around the world. Now, please don't forget also to post your questions for the panelists here. And um, although uh, many of the answers have now already been given uh, by the presenters, please, uh, we'll give you one more chance to fill out the pre-test uh, survey. Those who fill that out um, and who fill out post-test survey, which we've mailed out to you, will also receive the certificate for this uh, webinar. Now, Edward, or just um, one quick question. So if I understand correctly, you're looking uh, for people to submit projects. So how does that work? What is your selection process? In other words, you have funding from external partners. Uh, let's say that somebody uh, from um, an organization in Nepal uh, wants to um, have you do an analysis of their project, correct? So then is there a deadline for submitting projects? How does that selection process work, please, Eduardo? Yeah, so basically uh, the selection will go through the, the, so I can send the link also for the website. Uh, there, are, there is a formulaire to, to fill in with the main information about the project, and then we will receive all the information about the project. This goes through uh, a steering committee that will decide whether the project is filling to the criteria of the, of the, uh, the MBI center. And generally, it's, uh, the criteria is uh, more or less what I said before. So the main focus has to be about the... Uh, Climate change, uh, climate change adaptation, and the project needs to be also in developing countries. Uh, and uh, so the main impact has to be about the contribution to climate change adaptation. After that, there is a uh, whole process with the stakeholders, stakeholders in, uh, involvement that uh, it's a little bit the causal loop diagram that I showed before. All the stakeholders are involved in order to define the all variables and the all indicators that are 
necessary to make the assessment. And we also receive, it's important also that uh, the project initiator uh, give us as much possible data so that we, we can provide the most possible customized, customized assessment. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, really important information and very interesting, Eduardo. Okay, thank you, Eduardo, um, again. I uh, will give you a virtual uh, hand of uh, applause. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, now over to Professor Laszlo Pinter uh, from the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy of the Central European University. He's going to talk to us today about nature-based solutions for urban sustainability challenges and experiences from the Nature Nation Project. So uh, Laszlo, over to you, if you'd like to share your slides, please. Absolutely. And, great. And colleagues um, who have joined in, please put your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A session after the speakers. We have two more speakers, so please send in your questions. Okay, we see your presentation, Laszlo. So over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. And uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks uh, for the opportunity for the organizers uh, to, uh, to present briefly about some of the outputs from, um, uh, from NatureVation. You notice that uh, I have a, a complex, somewhat complicated set of affiliations. I'm full-time at CU. Uh, you notice that I also, I'm also affiliated with IISD, but uh, we did this uh, project through CEU. And uh, I'll explain what uh, the third component is at the very end. Um, that's physics solutions. Uh, so first of all, you did discuss the basics of MBS, so I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but uh, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of the Nature Vision Project, uh, our uh, fundamental uh, sort of starting point was uh, that uh, essentially MBS uh, present an opportunity to create uh, a new normal, uh, both in rural systems and in our, in, in our case, uh, urban systems where uh, gray instead of gray infrastructure, uh, we can actually use uh, natural infrastructure uh, in many cases with uh, multiple benefits. So, um, uh, whereas Eduardo uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, the use of their tool in all kinds of uh, contexts, urban and rural, uh, in, uh, in our case, we are focusing on cities based on the logic that, uh, that cities are growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they are also ones where unsustainability uh, challenges appear uh, in, uh, with the, sometimes with the greatest urgency affecting the largest number of uh, people and where the, uh, the opportunities for intervention are, uh, are the most uh, significant. So uh, Nature Vation uh, was a four-year um, uh, project uh, supported by the Horizon 2020 program of the of the EU. It was the consortium that was by uh, Durham University, and we had many partners across Europe. Uh, our primary focus was uh, on on countries in Europe, but uh, in our work, we already started going uh, beyond uh, the European context, uh, and we wanted to understand uh, a number of things. Uh, in, in part, um, what uh, can uh, what progress can be uh, achieved with NBS uh, to address urban sustainability challenges? Uh, what is the role of innovation uh, to, um, to speed up, accelerate, and make more impactful NBS integration in, uh, in cities? Uh, and then uh, uh, we also wanted to take stock of uh, just what MBS practices uh, are there and uh, what are some of the um, more impactful, more successful uh, cases. So, um, uh, to lay out the logic for um, understanding um, uh, impact. So uh, first of all, uh, there's a question uh, impact uh, related to what sustainability challenge. So then there is a, there's a, a wide sort of assortment of, uh, of challenges. Uh, some are biophysical, uh, like green space and habitat and biodiversity. Others are related to climate adaptation, um, Broadly speaking, environmental quality, water management, as, as uh, we'll hear about uh, in the next presentation. And there are also more sort of socioeconomic type uh, uh, challenges and potential benefits um, uh, related to economic development, human health and well-being, uh, but even social justice and, and, uh, and cohesion, as, uh, as Eduardo already mentioned, 
uh, how these solutions actually how these solutions are actually developed can itself be uh, uh, is is a very uh, a powerful uh, aspect of their uh, of their design. So in our work, we uh, we put great emphasis on uh, on understanding different modalities for participate uh, participation in uh, in NBS design and integration. So so that so on the one hand we have uh, we have the challenges. On the other hand, we have an assortment of uh, of MBS and. Uh, uh, the term is relatively new, but but many of the underlying ideas are, of course, old. And we used uh, uh, this type of classification, uh, which is by now uh, somewhat standardized uh, um, across Europe. So uh, eight categories of uh, of MBS, again with a common definition that uh, that MBS uh, uh, have uh, uh, have a hidden uh, potential and uh, and what is important is in their in their design that they are uh, there is actually they are used uh, uh, with a, a purpose of addressing sustainability challenges so they don't just happen uh, by accident they are used uh, uh, as a matter of design to address these problems so um oops uh so in terms of uh, trying to understand uh, impacts, uh, we, uh, we started with uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability challenges, then um, which vary by, uh, by location and, uh, and context. Again, as, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, um, the, uh, the actual context of the problem uh, is very important. So then uh, uh, we would need to uh, match the sustainability challenges with uh, an NBS that is actually most uh, physically effective, but also cost effective, uh, socially, culturally uh, applicable um, to that context, um, and then uh, apply that uh, in that given situation. And uh, NBS themselves are usually fairly, uh, fairly complex uh, undertakings. Uh, and uh, they always generate uh, multiple benefits. We can, uh, I put uh, SDG 11 here because uh, obviously uh, this is the SDG focused on cities and we can nest MBS under that. But at the same time, we also know that uh, that SDG 11 is actually linked to uh, to uh, essentially all other MBS, uh, all, all other SDGs uh, and the MBS that are implemented also have the potential to generate these uh, multiple impacts. So broadly speaking, this is uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, the framework. Now, uh, given the topic of this um, of this seminar, we were asked to uh, to relate uh, the use of MBS uh, to increasing resilience. And of course, sustainability is an important concept, but uh, increasingly we also have to factor in resilience uh, because. Um, uh, because of the uh, growing number of shocks that uh, that are affecting uh, sustainability, both in the urban and the and the rural context, so I just put one of the, the best known uh, uh, definitions of resilience, and and I really won't dwell on this. It's it's just a, a reminder. Again, on, in terms of understanding uh, uh, benefits uh, and impacts, uh, what. Um, we uh, find, uh, and again, this was already mentioned to Eduardo, even if it one uh, applies just a single uh, NBS uh, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a given context, uh, it will have multiple impacts. Uh, and those multiple impacts are, uh, are realized by, uh, by several, usually by several stakeholders. So uh, whereas, uh, let's say, um, uh, Revitalizing um, an urban uh, pond can uh, can have uh, an effect uh, at uh, at the local community level. There are other uh, types of impacts, uh, maybe uh, in the increase of tourism value, uh, and uh, and the, uh, and changes in property prices, contribution to biodiversity. So while while the cost is uh, uh, is uh, is a singular cost. Uh, the benefits uh, are cumulative, and uh, and very often uh, the the true value of uh, of MBS um, uh, are realized through when one takes into account uh, this uh, these cumulative uh, contributions. 
And of course, those also appear over time, sometimes not immediately, and the different types of benefits might, uh, might appear on different timescales. So one has to decide, uh, one has to look, uh, look um, into the future with a certain time horizon to understand what these cumulative uh, benefits, uh, both biophysical and social and economic, uh, look like. We also had uh, uh, interactions with a number of uh, financial institutions like the European Investment Bank and uh, uh, through Nativation. And one important message we got is that uh, that um, because of the of the growing interest of the financial sector in uh, in in green infrastructure and and yes, there is interest uh, in investing more, but uh, this requires uh, better evidence uh, that. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the impact. So this was basically one of the uh, starting point for uh, our work. Uh, I show you briefly, I'm at nine and a half minutes, so this will be uh, very quick. I'm going to show you two tools. Uh, so we also developed uh, uh, a custom tool that is um, focused on the urban context. We call this the Urban Nature Explorer. And uh, it can also be customized to basically any given uh, urban uh, situation. It starts with the definition of sustainability challenges, setting goals and targets related to indicators, then involves the selection of nature-based solutions and the projection of uh, impacts. So um, uh, we, ha we have to go through a number of questions in order to, uh, to make this assessment. So first of all, what is, uh, where is the in intervention being made? Uh, so far, we have three case studies in uh, Austria, Hungary, and Uruguay. The second is what are the challenges that are relevant for uh, for that uh, area, and very often those uh, those can be identified in consultation or should be identified uh, with local uh, stakeholders. What are the indicators that can describe uh, these challenges? Uh, what is the current value, the baseline of these indicators? So that's based on facts and evidence. Uh, decide what is the planning horizon. Is it uh, 2030, 2040, 2050? What are the business as usual projections of the indicators? That is to say, um, if things stay as is, let's say we have uh, uh, a dominantly uh, concrete um, um, urban core, uh, how would, for instance, uh, the heat island effect look like uh, in, that, uh, in that urban core uh, projected, let's say, to 2050? What are the desired indicator targets for the planning horizon? For instance, uh, if uh, if uh, the projection of uh, of the heat island effect is is considered very high, as it as it is the case, then uh, what would be acceptable? So, what would be an acceptable target? Then, what types of MBS can be used to uh, to uh, to move that indicator on that time horizon closer to the desired level? Uh, then we're getting spatial. How can you deploy these MBS or where uh, in this area? So what types of MBS and where, how many locations, at what cost? Uh, then what are the impact coefficients uh, of these uh, indicators? So basically the impact per unit of uh, MBS. And then what are the scaled up, up uh, impacts of all types for the, uh, for the entire area? At the end, how much uh, it will all cost? So these are all uh, questions and every single one of them is potentially uh, 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 complicated. Uh, last one is how, can you, how close can you get to the target with MBS? Keeping in mind that nature-based solutions are, are you know, not magic bullets, so they might solve some of the problems. So we developed uh, the, um, uh, the Urban Nature Explorer as, um, uh, as, a, as a tool. And what it, uh, what it basically does, I'm gonna switch to uh, another screen here, um, which is actually uh, um, the, uh, the live site and it will just take one minute. So there are three cases. Uh, uh, let's say if you go to, uh, to downtown Montevideo in the capital of Uruguay, it has all these uh, sustainability challenges. If I take urban heat island effect and select that as a problem, there are two indicators defined related to that. There's a projection of both indicators to the future that is shown by this trend line and the target, which is uh, trying to uh, indicate an acceptable level of these indicators. Uh, and then you go basically to uh, a, planning, uh, uh, a planning area. We, ke we kept this very simple. Again, we think participation is, is really key. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we kept this... Um, 
uh, interface. Very simple, and one basically goes about and chooses uh, um, uh, uh, chooses uh, various uh, nature-based solutions, uh, like a large park. And when you choose a nature-based solution, it it activates those locations in the uh, in the area where a large park actually is feasible or makes sense. And that's going to vary by MBS. And as you choose and deploy these solutions. Uh, an impact model in the background uh, calculates their impacts and projected to 20, uh, 2040 in this case. So you see how much progress you're making, plus there's a projection of the cost that again is calibrated to the local market. So I'm not going to dwell on this. This is all available online and I'll provide uh, links uh, later. I go back to, uh, to my slides right now and uh, I'm almost done. Um, so uh, in addition uh, to the Urban Nature Explorer, again, I just want to mention briefly, we developed uh, uh, the Urban Nature Atlas. We wanted to look at what are the most uh, uh, interesting uh, NBS, uh, 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 NBS initiatives uh, initially in Europe. So we, we did detailed case studies uh, of about a, ton, uh, a thousand cases. So 100 European cities and a thousand cases you can navigate through them through this interface. We also have an AI enabled uh, search engine. So it's, it's, it's very advanced. Um, and then we started uh, developing um, uh, a collection of cases outside of Europe. We are just starting actually to, uh, to, uh, to enrich uh, the database with more cases in collaboration with the Asia Europe Foundation in Singapore, looking mainly at Asia, Asian um, uh, examples. Um, that's the link to the Atlas. Uh, there are many examples, including just uh, just a handful uh, from uh, from India. Again, this is uh, and all the profiles of these cases are uh, uh, are uh, vetted very closely. So these are all evidence based, uh, uh, fairly precise descriptions. Based on, given the lar very large number of cases, we can analyze uh, um, different patterns of MBS use uh, uh, around the world, or in this case, uh, in related to cases uh, outside of Europe, like what types of challenges uh, these MBS in cities uh, tend to, ta uh, to tackle, uh, and so on. Um, very last uh, comment uh, about um, how can we really get to impact? N not a simple process. I mean, MBS can uh, be... Uh, uh, um, themselves can uh, involve uh, challenging planning. There is a need for policy and uh, and regulation, local regulations, national level that enable these. Um, finance, as we already mentioned, is important. Um, uh, and the urban development uh, professional community uh, also has to, uh, and is getting already on board, uh, plus civil society very often takes, uh, takes the, uh, the initiative. Very last slides with some links and uh, and our partners. Um, my last point is that uh, naturevation is uh, has ended uh, last May, and uh, uh, in order to keep the work on the on the tools I showed you uh, going um, in at at our innovation lab at the university, we established with some of my students uh, a startup, and that's Fizzy Earth. So we are continuing the work uh, through Fizzy, uh, which is in the process of being built up. Uh, Karen, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laszlo, for presenting these very practical tools. Um, I'm hoping that you can put some of those links in the chat uh, for our colleagues, and they may actually answer some of the questions that I see have popped up. A very long uh, question, for example, from uh, Dennis here in the chat. Um, so it's fantastic to see some of the more I would say quantitative analysis that is coming through, which actually corresponds to <laughs> responds to some of the questions like I said in the chat. So thank you again, Laszlo, and um, we will uh, like again. Please put the, those links in the chat. In the meantime, without further ado, we will request uh, Professor Konjian Yu. Uh, we're very pleased to have you, sir, joining us today. Uh, again, uh, founding uh, dean um, of and uh, chair of the. Um, Peking University College of Architecture and Landscape. So let's see, let's go ahead and if you can switch off your video, Laszlo, and we will shift to Professor Konjian Yu. Let's see, we're waiting for your presentation to come. I think it will come in just a few short in a minute here. 
Yes. Yeah. Don't see your presentation yet. Oh, really? Let's see. It worked before. Let's try one more time to share your screen. And if not, I think we have your slides on hand to share them. If I, I can do it again, yeah. I try one more time, sir. I'm sure. It okay. Works. Can you see it? It's. It says it started. Let's see here. Maybe just yeah. Here we go. So okay. You, yeah. Now just uh, full screen mode. Yeah, it's a whole screen. Let's see if you can click on the button below that shows the full screen mode. Yes. Let's try that. Yeah, let's see. Now we're on the first slide. Just full screen mode, almost there. Uh, so I try again. No problem. Okay. Uh, there's some really exciting questions that are coming in the chat for uh, after we've heard the last present. Now, here we go. Perfect. Yeah, okay. I see. Over to you, sir. 15 minutes. Thank you. Sure. So as so all the former speakers, just, uh, just uh, lay out the background for wh what I'm going to talk, because I'm going to talk exactly what should we do and how you do. I'm a landscape architect and talk about a climate adaptation Sponge city. Certainly, we all know that as a flood is a huge, it's a huge uh, uh, impact global wise. Last year, 300 people died on the street in in Zhengzhou, and a drought at the same time. So we have both. We have both, and uh, and the conventional solution is we call the gray infrastructure. But all the gray infrastructure actually accumulates risk, the higher risk and speed up the flow and fight against the nature, which all make us things worse. That's, uh, that's uh, and because it produces so much, so much carbon, so much carbon emission and, and it turns this globe into a, a, a very, really, really a cycle. Uh, so it consumes huge amount of energy, concrete and destroy nature and its resiliency and breaks the connection between man and nature. So, Nature-based solution is an alternative. I call it ecological infrastructure, or our former speakers say it's a nature-based uh, infrastructure, which is critical for securing ecosystem services woven together with gray infrastructure. So they should work together, uh, work together at least uh, in urban urban setting. Water is the key to such ecological infrastructure. A city built on water-centered ecological infrastructure is called sponge city. Its a philosophy is to retain water, slow down water flow, clean water by nature, and be adaptive to nature. So which are totally opposite to the gray infrastructure we are so much depend on based on industrial technologies. For over 20 years, we have tested and built over 500 projects in more than 200 cities, uh, 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 mainly in China, but also global wise. And the sponge city are inspired by the indigenous or ancient wisdom of farming and water management that use simple tools to transform the global service. Now, remember, climate change is nothing new for the, the monsoon region, the monsoon climate, like in China, Indonesia, Malaysia. So for thousands of years, we're terracing the ground, terracing the slope, pounding the ground, diking and pounding and islanding the, the wetland, the, to make the landscape or make the living system more, more livable and more safe and at the same time productive and sustainable. Now, those are the knowledge we're getting, we're getting inspired from. So those are uh, the project I just, uh, we just did in the past 20 years. And uh, 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 you can see here, I want to show just a couple examples to show some uh, basic solutions, the principles. So first principle is, about the urban inundation. The strategy is to regulate water on site to absorb urban flood. Over 65% of Chinese cities and global, uh, I mean, global wise means uh, monsoon regions, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, are suffering urban uh, access of water, urban inundation in the, in the three months uh, monsoon reason, the season. Now, so in the, your simple tools here, in this case, it is in, 
in China's Hainan Island, suffering monsoon climate. So we use terracing, ponding, islanding, integrating, habitat restoration, public space, water management together, create a vertical park. That's, that's the rendering, that's the rendering. And it take only one year to create such a one square kilometer uh, uh, park, which is in the middle of the city in Sanya city. Uh, this is today, just three years later, you see how dramatically it can be uh, tr transforming the landscape at the same time solve the problem. That's an that's islanding solution, terracing solution. People use a space and also uh, use island system. It removes the nutrients, it's the pollution, the pollutants. So it's a comparison before and after. Uh, and this is a comparison. Uh, you will see we are talking about how do you see now, how do you know that working? It is, we, we immediately can see that how it works. So it's a before and after. In five years, so the whole area transformed been flooded and now it's fairly safe and also urban development happened surrounding, uh, surrounding this area. And also remember it's a, so it's a property value increase 300 times, three, I mean 300 uh, percent, that's in just five years. So the strategy is to retain water at the source within the city. Now this is another case which has finished in just uh, two years ago it is an ash dump, a garbage dump in the middle of the city of uh, Nanchang city. New urban development happening surrounding it. So inspired by this uh, indigenous uh, island uh, farming system, we just uh, cut and fill, dump, uh, transform the dump site into a resilient floodable area. Now this is a monsoon flood, this is, uh, this is just in dry season, so you will see during the monsoon flood become a lake, a, a forest over the lake. And during the dry season, it become a park. People use a space. Now remember the monsoon only a only, only couple of weeks in, his, in this area or even have you know, only one day, a, a huge storm fall in just one day. So if you create such a resilient uh, space, you virtually use a, the, use a landscape for multiple ecosystem services. Now look at how people love this place. And at the same time, this area can, can regulate a million cubic meter of water. Fluctuation of water table can be two meters high. And another strategy is what about the, the, the rivers? You know, this, uh, con this uh, uh, business as usual model of channelizing and uh, concrete channelize the river, build a higher and higher flood wall but we actually move concrete, terracing the riverbank and create a nature-based solution to adapt to the water flow. And this is a case you see how a hundred year flood uh, can take over the park, but, uh, but the, um, then uh, two days later, it become a beautiful park. At the same time, people use it and uh, solve the problem of urban, uh, urban flood. This is how the riverbank looks like. Compared to the form of the concrete, you will see how beautiful it can it can be. Now this is an early early case. Uh, it's about twenty years ago we did this such kind of project. Remove the concrete, the, the, the covered with nature uh, based solution, terracing and create a wetland along the along the river. Not necessarily increase the area, but actually you do based on science. You analyze where the water goes actually. Now today we we just. Uh, uh, you unanimously see how this river been channelized use concrete, uh, but uh, here you see how we, based on ge geographical analysis, how can we create a resilient river? Now we are talking about the transformation of the whole whole infrastructure. This is a case in in Hainan Island in Haiko, about 21 kilometers long. For 20 years, it's been polluted and flooded and People keep channelizing and the dredging the river. Now, just five years ago, we take another solution, which is a nature-based solution, remove the concrete, the terracing riverbank, and clean the urban runoff. This is how the process goes. Uh, use nature to clean the urban runoff. At the same time, create a habitat and, uh, and, uh, and a park for the people and see uh, how people use this space, a resilient landscape being created. Now, what about is at the, at the ocean front? What is the ocean side? 
uh, we are talking about this uh, uh, urban, I, I mean, about this uh, climate uh, uh, change. Now, is that mean we have to build a higher and higher flood wall? Uh, not necessarily. Now, this is the case in Sanya again, we actually move the flood wall, this side, this was a site, and people, is just the building the flood wall. And we have successfully convinced the local mayor to stop the project and to remove the concrete and take the nature-based solution to terracing uh, and to let the nature to integrate the fresh water and the salt water together and to create a blackish water that allows the mangrove to, to get really established. And this is at the same time for people to use it. Now here is another bigger case here in, in North China's uh, uh, Qinghuangdao, a very polluted uh, ocean side, uh, coastal land. And we, we pour, we make the landscape porous, retain the storm water and filtrate the urban runoff and clean the water. So actually you can create a multiple habitat uh, 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 for biodiversity and also serves serve as a, a park at the same time. So to conclude, more than ever, we have to think of the way we build our cities and the way we treat water and nature and even the way we define civilization. Remember, we always define civilization based on how complicated our technologies and how much concrete we use, how much highway, how much flood wall we use and, and to define our civilization. Now, today we need a new definition, definition. So sponge city or sponge planet is a holistic, a nature-based solution to protect and restore ecological infrastructure or you will say nature-based infrastructure and to make wise use of nature's free surfaces. Now that's important, free surfaces for the benefit of the planet and the welfare of the people. Now that's nothing new, I will say. For a long time, for thousands of years ago, in China, there's a legendary figure, King Yu the Great. He was like the first king in China and he know how to manage water, make wise use of nature, and also make people have a safe place. But such a big vision, he has such a big vision to create a, 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 a safe globe, a sustainable globe. But we can just act like a person, simple, like farmers do, to transform the globe. Imagine how vast is the scale when you go to New, uh, 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 China, south, southeast, southwest China, and when you visit the, uh, 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 India or Malaysia, Indonesia, how vast is the scale the farmers have transformed in order to make sustainable living. Now, I think today we have to revive to this kind of ancient wisdom, but certainly upgrade it to solve the climate, uh, climate problem. Thank you, that's my talk, Karen. Well, thank you, sir. I think I will call you now King Yu the Great because uh, uh, really, this was a very inspiring uh, presentation. I would like to give a round of applause to you and to all of the presenters. I was very inspired. And I think that uh, we see so many people in the chat saying, uh, thank you so much. Um, and it's very excellent presentation, very insightful. And we know that the Sponge Cities is really providing an excellent example uh, for other cities around the world uh, who have been seeing how they can also implement such examples elsewhere. Now, um, I would like to give opportunity to uh, open um, for some, uh, to have uh, panelists turn on their cameras, please. And um, if the organizers could put all their presenters um, on um, uh, in gallery mode on the screen. So if we could also have uh, Laszlo, Eduardo, um, and uh, Joseph uh, join. And we have a couple of questions now. We have a few minutes left. Uh, so thanks again to all the presenters. I was, I've been very inspired uh, by all of your talks and so have the uh, people who, the participants. So there are a couple of questions. I'm going to try to combine them because we won't have time to answer all of them. But there were a couple of questions on risks. Um, we had a question from Dayan Namusangin. He was the first one to, or she, the first one to send a, a question in. How are you assessing risks? and um, quantification of risks compared to um, the solutions provided by nature-based solutions. In other words, um, 
Can we look at also any negative impacts? Could there be any maladaptation that come from nature-based solutions? So uh, let's um, hear, perhaps we can hear first from Professor Yu. Um, have you seen, um, how do you assess risks and could there be any maladaptations or any negative impacts from the nature-based solutions work that you have been doing, sir? Well, yes, that's a very good question. You know, I'm talking about this revolutionary change. So you just cannot just use nature-based solution to, to, as, a one, as one shot. You have to think of how to manage the city in a different way. For example, if you create such a big, large scale uh, wetland system, so what about the mosquito waste? And what about the uh, second uh, pollution? When, because when you overgrown for, for two years, the pollution come back. So, so but those, you have to understand that. You, you cannot just manage it like, uh, like a for sale or like ornamental park. You have to manage it like an agricultural landscape, make it productive. To come, to come with a cycle, you know, you have to harvest the wetland, but you, but that's not a bad thing, okay? Because you harvest it, you actually, you, you actually create create this uh, uh, beauty, but you also create a biomass, and you then you have to use to know how to use a biomass. No, so that's not a bad thing. But if you uh, 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 messed up, you if you think it's just a dump into uh, some garbage dump. No, that's another problem. Okay, that's. I think will be that's a management uh, uh, problem. The second is certainly uh, about uh, 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 mis misoperation. You know, people talking about nature-based solution or whatever, but we you, we have to understand it is a system. We we need to go systematic approach. Right? That's a, a nature. So if you put a nature into this, you need to create a healthy ecosystem. A healthy because that's important. Uh, I will say, uh, I, I, I really think that uh, the former speakers really do a good thing to, to evaluate the performance. We need the best practice to know how they perform. Uh, uh, we did a lot of time, uh, we, we did uh, many, for, for many years, we see that, for example, pollution, one hectare of wetland can produce uh, 800 cubic meter of water daily. Now, what daily, if it run well for 10 years, it's a, it function very well. Uh, so all this data needed to be really uh, uh, important for feedback the design. So we need a whole system of change, the knowledge about management, about operation. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, would any of the other speakers like to comment on that question on the maladaptation or on the risks? Yeah, uh, maybe I'll... Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, this question of, um, uh, well, maladaptation or, or can uh, nature-based solutions also have ne potential negative effects? I mean, that came up uh, a lot. I mean, you know, I mean, that's why uh, I, I said that, uh, you know, they are not a ma magic bullet. Um, so they, ca they have costs. They can, they have multiple, uh, multiple impacts. Some of those impacts, if one is not careful in, in considering uh, uh, the impacts uh, for some stakeholders at some point in time can be, uh, can be, uh, can be negative. So I think from that perspective, uh, we need really, and I, I just really uh, back up uh, Professor uh, Yu's point, you need a systems-based uh, perspective. And very often when we talk about effectiveness, the, the inclination is that uh, to, you know, as they say, you know, uh, we manage uh, what we measure. And very often, you know, we just use uh, monetary, uh, monetary values uh, to, you know, is, is, is this worth doing or not worth doing? And, and uh, given the, the, um, the diversity of impacts, that's, that's really not enough. So we need uh, to have uh, integrated metrics uh, that also include uh, the physical impacts of course, as well as the costs, but keeping in mind that not everything can be expressed in financial terms and they are still relevant. Uh -huh. uh, so that integrated perspective, system-based perspective is very, I think very important. And when you project it to the future, of course, there is also uncertainty. Like as you know, Eduardo showed, there can be there are different climate scenarios, and under different climate scenarios, then the impacts will likely be different. So that also has to be taken okay, into account. Great. Thank you. Joseph, did you want to say something on that? Please go ahead. 
Yeah, maybe just to complement that quickly, um, I think part of this is also about things like selecting the right types of trees, for example, for planting the right species. It can't just be about um, planting trees any type, anywhere. The, the siting is really important as well, obviously, um, so that that, for example, doesn't undermine cultural landscapes, which are also relates to what Laszlo was saying in terms of things that can't be quantified necessarily, but still hold intrinsic value as well. So um, I think yeah, echoing that, it's about integrating it with these different benefits, um, cost and having a systems perspective. Great, thank you. And I think you also responded to some of the questions I saw in the chat related to resilience and sustainability, which is what uh, taking a systems approach is also about. Now, there was a question from Sandesh Hamal on what are the incentives and motivation for governments and private sector for shifting to nature-based solutions? I don't know, Eduardo, would you like to respond to that one first? Do you have any thoughts on that, please? Sorry, can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, there was a, a question on what are the incentives and motivation for both government and private sector for supporting nature-based solutions? Yeah, so yes, this is a little bit the, the, the big point of the big discussion because the one of the things is that to show the business case for natural-based solution, natural-based natural -based infrastructure, so to actually demonstrate all the benefits and the uh, and the performance that can be provided by uh, the uh, by this type of infrastructure. For example, talking uh, talking the, taking the example of investors, one of their main uh, 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 argument that it's difficult to invest or to ensure uh, natural based infrastructure is the lack of data and the lack of uh, of uh, past performance. So. As the important thing is that to in increase the number of uh, of uh, data assessments and all the uh, literature, all the uh, all the, the uh, available quantification uh, uh, of assessment and uh, and data that are that show that there is a business case for this type of infrastructure. In this way, is also is also possible to provide. Uh, Good arguments to municipalities, governments, to show that it's this type of infrastructure perform better, for example, than grey infrastructure, considering the specific area and so on. Okay, so it's by showing the data, it's by showing the case studies, it's by showing the photos, uh, for example. There's another question from Kiran Gauda: How can we make the local communities accept and maintain nature-based solution interventions? or in coordination with gray infrastructure, um, any examples would be appreciated. Well, I think we saw many examples, Kiran, but uh, for example, Professor Yu, did you see any examples where local community had to be a bit more convinced or they were skeptical or um, you had to have dialogues with local communities? Can you give some uh, uh, experience on that? Well, I, I, I have a good example that we did, uh, we did a, one case in Tianjin, we use a nature-based solution. Uh, actually, it's a community come in and love it and define it. Now, so, so, so I will say it is as an engineer, it's the knowledge we had that to stop the processing, the, the, the accusation, I mean, the execution of nature-based. It is a textbook we educated in universities or the code system or the, uh, uh, we, we will say the technocratic, uh, uh, the bureaucratic systems that stop or applying the nature-based solution, not as a public, not as a, a community, because they love it. So you, you must make the nature-based solution beautiful, certainly it is a love it, it is a biophilia, you know, people love it, people use it. So I think it's, there's no, uh, no uh, uh, people will love it. So the only thing stop doing that is our knowledge being accumulated in, in this so-called intellectual infrastructure. We have okay. to, <laughs> we are changing that. Super, thank you. Do you have any other, uh, any other participants, uh, speakers would like to mention anything on community uh, knowledge or resistance or acceptance of nature-based solutions? Joseph? Yeah, thanks. I think on that, um it's important to almost kind of turn it around and think and start off with what the needs are and jointly defining needs with local communities rather than potentially framing these things as um, like an imposition or an external um, implementation. Uh, and there's a good example actually from Ecuador with um, water funds there. So they used water funds to um, ensure reliable water supply in the context of threats from climate change. And they did that through things like um, riparian fencing, 
tree replanting conservation activities. And there was a local um, so-called water parliament that was um, designed with participation from indigenous communities. And it had the role of overseeing implementation, defining the needs um, and providing general oversight and accountability. So I think there's some interesting examples of mechanisms there that can help um, make the solutions more participatory and focus on the, the real needs of communities and addressing the global crisis simultaneously. Great, thank you. I have a quick question for Marcus Oxley uh, for you, uh, Joseph. Why is principle seven focused only on enhancing economic benefits? Shouldn't the good practice principle seek to under understand inter interlinkages across economic, social and economic domains? Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. If you could just give a short answer to that, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so principle seven, it's what that's really about is kind of acknowledging that there are a lot of important economic benefits, but, uh, but actually the first um, kind of component or subtitle of that principle is about creating co-benefits. So that is really looking at the, the benefits in terms of um, social sustainability, environmental sustainability, and looking at factors like well-being, um, the types of jobs that can be created through infrastructure. So not just the kind of pure um, short-term economic growth, which is quite well documented for, for infrastructure investment. Um, but that's really what we're trying to capture. And also by highlighting that um, none of the principles should be implemented in isolation. So obviously um, that speaks to the idea of connecting that with principle four, for example. So enhancing economic benefits by investing in nature or by um, adopting and prioritizing nature-based solutions. Um, so yeah, the, the, the kind of message there from principle seven is not just to focus on um, purely the economic benefits, but also the co-benefits and connecting that with the different elements of the principles. I hope that's answered the question, um, but I'm happy to, to share more information about that and, and um, follow up if useful. Great. One last question uh, will come to Laszlo, then I'll ask you all for a closing remark. Uh, Laszlo, in terms of which would be a nature-based solution that would work well with agricultural sustainability? Over to you, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, us that way, that's a, uh, that's a very broad question. So uh, one would need to understand uh, the context uh, because agriculture, of course, has uh, many sustainability challenges from, uh, you know, from erosion risk to water pollution to biodiversity and so on. And, uh, uh, and as, uh, as I think we, we, uh, we uh, alluded to this, nature-based solutions can, uh, can address uh, a combination of those, uh, so um, so one would one would want to understand what type of context uh, you know is it the cotton sector uh, in in eastern India or is it uh, uh, you know uh, some uh, uh, beef cattle operation somewhere else? So it's an, uh, the sector itself is very diverse. So one one would want to go in with an, an open and uh, diagnostic mind to understand uh, the problem through the eyes uh, of uh, of the local stakeholders. Um, Farmers, representatives of industry, local, you know, chambers, and so on and so on, um, and small producers. Uh, and then, once it's understood, then there is a great library of uh, of uh, uh, of possible interventions through uh, through MBS. Uh, likely, uh, some cases that we're trying to tackle a similar problem. And then you would want to understand, you know, what would work in my particular case. You know, something that might have worked in. Uh, um, in Germany or the U.S. Midwest will likely not be applicable in in China or India in in that mm -hmm. in that given case. So, so there is a so learning from other cases is 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 a, is a good opportunity, but one has to keep this sort of critical mind uh, throughout. Um, Basically, there is no one recipe for nature-based solutions. I would say that was one would be one of the take-home messages, right? Um, so in concluding, um, I would like to, for each of you to have just a very quick statement. Uh, maybe you have messages for participants attending COP27, which start on Sunday. Uh, so let's uh, start with you, Joseph. What would be your concluding statement, please? Let's keep it uh, short since we've uh, reached the end of our session. Please, over to you, Joseph. Sure, um, thank you. So I would highlight that um, infrastructure broadly underpins 92% of the SDG targets that's found um, through, through UNOPS's analysis. Um, and so really thinking about what are the most powerful levers to achieve that and what are the infrastructure options that we should be prioritizing, that's what's key. And I think nature-based solutions can play a really important role um, despite many of the challenges and the, the limitations, I think through 
improved assessments, evaluations um, and appraisals and, and local community participation. I think hopefully the, the guiding principles that I outlined provide a, a broad framework for that. And then the tools like Savvy and the case studies from around the world we've heard here um, can provide some inspiration on the, on the local level. So um, those would be my, my concluding remarks. And thanks again for, for the invitation. Thank you for that. Uh, Eduardo, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So as of my closing remark from uh, uh, a more broadened perspective, it will be important to have governments from federal to local level to implement more policy to uh, provide more uh, framework for natural-based solutions uh, that would allow for larger, larger investments to convey towards natural-based solution. That will be it will be a possible solution. Like there are frameworks also at the EU level that can be improved, uh, green deals and different type of. Uh, 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 government policies, regulation that can uh, provide a better landscape to invest in this type of, uh, of, of solutions and natural-based solutions. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Laszlo, over to you, please. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, my final point is um, to, to perhaps to complement what Eduardo just said. Uh, it's important for uh, for government uh, to create an enabling environment, but very often we also have to realize that there are very interesting local initiatives uh, that uh, that start on their own. They they are rooted in in recognizing real practical interests uh, and uh, and problems. Uh, and ideally, there has to be a match between that you know drive coming and need coming from from the local level. And it has to be enabled uh, uh, by uh, by higher level support. So this matching aligning of interest is uh, is very important. Thank you for that. And I remind the participants to please take the post test um, survey. And um, also, I'm sorry that we're not able to answer all the questions. But over to you, uh, Professor Yu, for the final concluding remarks, please. Yes. Yeah, the so whole globe, the global is very sick. We have to understand that. There's no, there's, there's no we, we, it, we have to understand why cause such a sick sickness. It's because we offer your so-called industrial technologies. So there's no other way. And uh, to, to recover the globe, the healthiness of the globe is the only way that can provide a free service. We have to go back. We have to think of the, the, the system so that's why I think we, we need from top down and bottom up, both. From top down, we need to really transform the, the mentality of our decision makers. I, I have a book called, uh, this is a letter to leaders of China, a letter to leaders of, of the globe. They have to do that. You know, the policy uh, needed to trans fundamental change. Uh, uh, so fundamental because it's a whole system, knowledge system, policy, financial investment. So. We invest too much on so-called gray technologies, too much, and, and it just uh, cannot just fix uh, the, the globe. So that's why nature-based solution is uh, the only holistic approach, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks again to all of the uh, panelists and participants. So let's give each other a huge round of applause. Um, and these are very strong messages to anybody who's uh, going to COP27 and beyond. Uh, change is happening. Um, it's been happening in the negative sense. And I see things now shifting in a positive way with nature-based solutions, um, hybrid solutions. We're seeing more quantification of um, positive impacts and we're being very careful in trying to manage the risks and the negative, uh, any, pos any possible negative impacts of nature-based solutions. So um, we will, um, the, the meeting participants uh, will be sending emails to all of the um, participants with the link again to the post-test uh, survey. And for those who have completed the pre and post-test, you will be receiving certificates um, and I believe that uh, there will be recording of this uh, session and it looks like it'll be uploaded uh, to YouTube. So again, we will close this session now and thanks again to all who have participated and especially to the presenters. I've learned a lot and I think everybody else has too. Thank you and stay safe 
and um, hoped that our paths will cross again one day. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wonderful.